whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no hollow heart, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. I'm Lindsay on crack. Oh, no. Lindsay had a new kind of coffee, and she is on fire. Whoa, buddy. If anybody, this is, we are not endorsed by this company, but I'm really into Four Sigmatic. It's a um, mushroom company, not magic mushrooms, like reishi, lion's mane, ashwagandha, all the Mm -hmm. things. And I've been drinking their half calf, which is excellent, but it has ashwagandha in it, which is a has a more calming. And then their full calf, it's like in this orange bag, and it says "think" and like for clarity. And I was uh-huh. like, "That sounds great." I had it about seven <laughs> hours ago, and I ding 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 ding. I am going to work <laughs> so hard to just contain it. Okay, because. It's real hard. <laughs> uh, real quick, you, uh, uh, real quick. Excuse me. A big thank you to new listeners who found us thanks to having "Scared to Death" featured on Spotify recently, uh, and thanks to the first "Nightmare Fuel" episode being separately also featured on Spotify. Woohoo! So, look at you. Yeah, we appreciate you joining us, and huge thanks to the curators at Spotify for throwing us on some cool lists. Yeah, we we like you guys. And then uh, Lindsay has a charity announcement, and then we're into the stories. I do, and we are recording well in advance. This is the. Uh, May 21st episode, yeah. and it's still April. So I don't have a dollar amount, mm-hmm. but this month we landed on an animal nonprofit. Big thanks to a fan, Liz Swift, who volunteers extensively with The Love Pit. Uh, she put them on our radar. And the mission of The Love Pit is to save dogs that are at risk of euthanasia, have severe medical needs, or who need rescuing, rehab, training, and so on. Uh, they even help foster dogs. So that's super awesome. I could never do it. I'd never yeah. give the dog back. Uh, but we'll update you on the amount as we as it comes in. And if you'd like to learn more, since uh uh-huh. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to the lovepitrescue.org. Perfect. Lovepitrescue.org. The love pit rescue.org. Oh, the love pit Don't forget the. And how many fans submitted supposedly true horror stories do you have today? Oh, I'm amusing myself so much. I <laughs> I have two. Uh, my first story brings into question our show oh. and wondering if by listening, you are inviting things mm. into your life. Okay. And then my second tale is a haunted house tale involving someone house sitting. And it makes you wonder, like, what if someone was house sitting for you mm-hmm. and then said something happened at your house? Like, how do you yeah. How do you uh, reconcile that? Okay. Okay, uh, looking forward to hearing those. Um, I have two, and I can't believe we haven't covered the first one before. Uh, my first story is a look at the many haunted claims coming from Tonopah, Nevada's The Clown Motel. Oh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, it's a motel that builds itself as America's scariest motel, and it is uh, it is unique, if nothing else. You're afraid of clowns. How? You know what? I, I feel like I've eased on it. Well, I still would want to see one, but I don't think about it as much anymore. I feel like other things have, I don't know. Could you stay in that hotel? Well, okay. Yeah, I don't Busted. know. If, I don't know if I would want to say that. Liar. Myself. Got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, after that story, we'll head to just outside of Washington D.C. Look at the history of some old politically fueled duels and the ghosts those duels may have produced. Okay, that's fun. Yeah, each story will include a uh, brief modern encounter claim. How fitting. So once your uh, weekly spoopy socks are showcased, look at these babies. S'mores, aren't those cute? <laughs> those are cute. Here's a fun fact: Lindsay does not like s'mores. I think they're gross. I love them, though. Ugh. Okay, so I'll start uh, sharing the history behind the haunting of this first story All right, before getting into the, the spoops. Let's go. The Clown Motel in Tonopah, Nevada, is often called America's scariest motel. Tonopah is one of the most remote towns in the lower 48 states. With around 2,000 people, it's over 150 miles from anything bigger, the nearest small city being Pahrump, Nevada, <laughs> 45,000 people living 167 miles away. The desert town sits halfway between Reno and Las Vegas, over 200 miles from either city, and was nicknamed Queen of the Silver Camps for its mining-rich history. It was founded in the early 20th century after the discovery of some silver ore just lying on the surface of the ground that led to one of the biggest silver strikes in U.S. history. 
According to local legends, on May 19, 1900, prospector Jim Butler stopped in the area of what is now Tonopah to camp overnight and lost one of his donkeys. He found the rogue animal the next morning standing near a rock outcropping. He picked up a stone intending to throw it at the donkey in frustration, but then paused when he noticed how heavy it was. He looked around, picked up some more similar rocks, and realized these stones were silver ore. After making the discovery, Butler quickly staked eight claims in Tonopah and leased them for a year with 25% royalties. Following this discovery, more prospectors soon unsurprisingly flocked to the area. By January of 1901, 40 people were living in the newly established settlement. Within a few months, there was 250 people. In 1903, construction started on a railroad that would connect Tonopah to Carson City, over 200 miles away, and bring in more fortune seekers. By the end of 1903, there were 3,000 people in the mining town, and the residents now enjoyed 32 saloons, two dance halls, numerous stores, several churches, and more. The railroad was completed in July of 1904, and while the town itself never properly incorporated, it did elect its first city officials in late in July of two, uh, 1905. And by that time, around 10,000 people were now living in the area. Some sources say that in the following decade, the population soared to a peak of about 50,000 people. Whew. Today, the town, being far from its silver mining heyday, uh, has just a fraction of that number, around 2,000 people. The town's first cemetery was built in 1901 in a lot right next to the current Clown Motel. Over 300 people were buried in it before it closed in 1911. Some of those buried were victims of two strange plagues that affected the town in 1902 and 1905. The so-called Tonopah Plague of 1905 was the worst, caused quite the panic in town. Between January and April of that year, 56 people died, the majority of them young and healthy before suddenly getting sick, most of them buried in that original cemetery. Oddly, the disease only seemed to affect men. In addition to the victims of that strange illness that swept through town, there are several more notable people who were buried in the original Tonopah Cemetery. One of those individuals is George Devil Davis, the first black resident of Tonopah. George became the political leader of the city's first black community, and he owned the Eureka Saloon. He was known for being a prankster, was well-liked by the townspeople, but also had the terrible reputation of being a very abusive husband. And on June 22nd, 1907, his wife, Ruth Davis, came into her husband's saloon and shot him in the back. <gasps> and then shot him again and again and again. But also... Ruth would only serve a year in prison because of the abuse she had received at George's hands. Good for her. It is now said that the ghost of George Davis lingers in the community and that he haunts the Tonopah Liquor Company still playing pranks in the afterlife. Another famous person in the cemetery is Bina Veralt, a woman from New York. Bina and her friend Isella Brown once ran a so-called love syndicate in New York City. For years, they seduced rich men for gifts and money until they fled to avoid punishment for their scams. One man fell for Bina, wanted to marry her, but she refused his advances. She also refused to return his gifts. He ended up pressing charges for fraud and theft, and during the subsequent investigation, the police discovered that the women had collected over $100,000 worth of clothing, jewelry, and money. Bina pawned off her diamond rings and fled during the trial and made it all the way to Nevada. She ended up in Tonopah, where she later died from complications of alcoholism. And now some believe that Bina's spirit resides in the Tonopah Historic Mining Park Visitor Center. Occasionally, a woman's figure is spotted in the windows. Others hear disembodied voices and have captured strange things on cameras in this area. The final people laid to rest in the Tonopah Cemetery were victims of the Belmont Mine Fire of 1911. The fire was first noticed at 5.50 a.m. Thursday morning, February 23rd that year. Officials determined it was started by a pile of timber left near the bottom of a mine shaft, which was accidentally ignited by a small candle. Initially, a Belmont superintendent told the miners to ignore the fire because it was burning in a separate location from their work zone. The miners protested, but worried about losing their jobs, most of them went, uh, went to work against their better judgment. Sadly, the miners' unfamiliarity with firefighting techniques and an unfortunate reversal of air currents worsened the fire and pushed smoke into parts of the mine that were previously declared safe. All men, excluding firefighters, were now ordered to evacuate, but those orders did not reach the men in time. Some now became trapped in shaft stations, and four men fell off the cage while being hoisted up. Tonopah resident William F. Murphy volunteered to go down and rescue as many people as he could. He made three trips down into the mine before the mine took him. After his third trip down, a group of miners would come back up to the surface, but Murphy was not amongst them. The miner said he fell from the cage on the way up. 
His last words were, well, boys, I've made two trips and I'm nearly all in, but I'll try again. In total, 17 men died, including William. He and the others were buried in that original Tonopah Cemetery. The Belmont Mine would remain operational for the next three decades, finally shutting down after another deadly fire in 1942. One of the victims of that fire was a man named Clarence David. And in 1985, two of Clarence's children, Leona and Leroy David, honored their father by building the Clown Motel next to the cemetery. Clarence loved clowns. Okay. And had a collection of somewhere around 150 clown figurines. Okay. Leona and Leroy decorated the motel with bright colors, also placed their father's clowns all throughout the building. A decade later, in 1995, Leona and Leroy sold the business to Bob and Deborah Perchetti after adding many more clowns to the hotel, hundreds of extra figurines. And ever since, the clown motel has developed quite the reputation for being extremely haunted. Time now for the tale of the clown motel. Bob Perchetti believes that the motel's proximity to the cemetery is the reason for all the paranormal activity. The Clown Motel offers 31 rooms, and some rooms are reportedly much more haunted than others. Room 108 is believed to be haunted by the spirit of a former front desk manager. The man was not just working at the, ho- at the motel, but also living there. And he was staying in room 108 when he started to feel violently ill one night. He tried to call the other front desk manager for help, but received no response. Soon thereafter, he called his sister who dialed 911. Unfortunately, it was now too late, and he died on the way to the hospital. When the second manager was questioned by the police, he insisted that the front desk phone had never rang, and his statement was then verified by security footage. Did any entities in the motel try and prevent that second manager from getting help? Ever since this manager's death, guests in room 108 have occasionally claimed to have heard strange voices, had their belongings moved, or lost them altogether. At some point, the ghost of room 108 was nicknamed the Trickster, Another haunted room is just a few doors down, room 111. A terminally ill man spent his final days in this room. The poor guy is said to have rented a room at the motel because he did not want his family to experience finding his body at home. He allegedly told a staff member that a shadowy entity appeared in his room in the middle of the night and that he pleaded with his spirit to take his life and end his suffering, but the spirit refused. And then the next day, he literally took matters into his own hands and shot himself in the motel parking lot. Room 210 is also said to be haunted. A man from Arizona was in the middle of a long road trip when he stopped at the Clown Motel and spent the night in room 210. He suffered from chronic back pain, which started to flare up during his drive. After a night of rest amongst the clowns, he woke up pain-free and believed that the spirits of the Clown Motel had cured him. Afraid of leaving and having his debilitating back pain return, he spent the next six years... Stop it. ...living in room 210 until he passed away one night in his sleep. Room 214 is said to be haunted by the spirit of an unknown person. The ghost reportedly taunts guests by turning the lights on and off throughout the night or stealing and hiding their belongings in unusual places. So why do so many spirits inhabit this particular motel? Is there something about clowns specifically that attracts the restless dead? One common theory is that the hotel's increasingly massive collection of clown figurines act as vessels for the spirits in the cemetery, which could explain the many reports of various clown figurines seen moving about on their own. A former manager claimed that one particular clown figure moved around almost every night. However, not all the spirits said to now inhabit this motel find themselves inside one of the figurines. Sometimes semi-translucent, ethereal human shapes have been witnessed wandering in and out of rooms, walking to walls. Some guests have allegedly heard disembodied voices. Maybe most terrifying, a few guests have claimed to have seen a tall clown figure standing at the foot of their bed in the middle of the night. The shadowy apparition of a man has been spotted walking in between the motel and the nearby cemetery. In 2017, the clown motel went up for sale again. Terms of the sale specified that any new owners would have to agree to continue to operate the property as a clown-themed motel and to also look after its growing clown collection. In 2019, brothers Vijay Mahar and Hame Anand uh, purchased and refurbished the motel and leaned further into its haunted reputation. They painted several rooms with images from famous horror movies like The Exorcist, It, Halloween, and Friday the 13th. Hame also has an affinity for clowns, He has added hundreds of additional figurines to the motel's collection, bringing the total to over 5,000 now. 
It's believed that the Clown Motel has the largest private collection of clown figurines and memorabilia in the world. Hame did an interview with the website Thrillist, where he said he was initially scared of the motel and couldn't sleep after hearing disturbing noises inside rooms he knew were empty. But he has since come to believe that there are mostly good spirits residing within its rooms. And now for one more claim from the Clown Motel. The following man who posted under the name of Doug1976 on a paranormal forum, unlike Hame, does not seem to believe that the Clown Motel is safe and full of mostly good spirits. I'll be honest. I was hoping to have a par paranormal encounter. Why the hell else would I make the eight-hour drive from Phoenix to Tonopah? Don't get me wrong. Tonopah has a few cute restaurants and a bit of charm, but come on. I already live in the desert. And a four-star cafe in Tonopah ain't quite the same as a four-star cafe in Phoenix. I came for a weekend back in 2019 because I'd been a fan of horror my whole life. Books, movies, video games, all of it. But still, at the age of 45, I had yet to have a single paranormal experience. And I was starting to think that it was all a bunch of bullshit. So I looked up some lists of haunted hotels. If I was going to go someplace that was haunted, I didn't want to just be a part of a guided tour where we'd be in and out in an hour. I wanted to stay the night. Stay a few nights. And I wanted to stay somewhere where it seemed like damn near everyone sees or hears something. So after seeing the Clown Motel show up on several lists and watching some YouTube videos and an episode of Ghost Adventures where the guys got real spooked, I booked room 111. After poking around in some forums, it seemed to be the most haunted. I took a Friday off of work, left first thing in the morning, and checked in around 6 p.m. After grabbing a bite to eat, I'll admit the stage stop cafe was pretty damn good. I was back in my room by 8, and I was in for the night. I watched that old classic horror movie, Poltergeist, on my laptop in the dark to get myself good and spooked. And I went to bed with high hopes. But nothing. The next day, I wandered around the cemetery, took a ghost tour of the Mitzpah Hotel, where I also didn't see anything. That hotel is another supposedly haunted location in Tonopah, and I waited for nightfall. I was not as hopeful this time. I watched It on my laptop that second night. Gotta stick with the clown theme, right? And after not seeing or hearing anything paranormal again, I fell asleep, pretty disappointed, around midnight, and then woke up a little after three in the morning. And when I got up to use the bathroom, he was standing at the foot of my bed. The dark figure of a clown, the size of a large man, Believe it or not, I wasn't scared at first. I figured I was dreaming. That would make sense. I'm staying at the Clown Motel, watching clown-related horror movies, thinking about experiences that other guests have supposedly had where I'm staying. Of course I would see this thing, right? I actually started to laugh, but then all of the little clown dolls and figurines in my room started to move towards me surrounding my bed. I was not laughing anymore. Now I really hoped I was dreaming, but it didn't feel like a dream. I felt very, very much awake. And then that thing at the foot of my bed climbed up onto my bed, pushing the mattress down and ominously crawling towards me as I pulled my legs up to my chest. All the little figures around the bed, it was like they started to vibrate now, like they were excited to watch the show that was about to start. A real life horror movie and I was the star. And then he grabbed me. <gasps> he grabbed my ankle with a hand that was as cold as ice and very real. And it made me scream. Still screaming, I started to kick at him. And he was solid. I was connecting with something real. He was holding onto my ankle something fierce, too, and it started to hurt. So cold, it felt like he was burning me. After a few wild kicks, I knocked him back, and then I jumped off the bed, jumped again over those creepy dolls, grabbed my keys that were laying on the dresser, and ran out into the parking lot and only my boxers. I ran straight from my car, didn't even shut the door. I just jumped in and locked it. I was facing my room, and I just sat there, staring straight ahead of the door I had just ran out of and the window next to it. And I saw him again. He walked over to the door and just stood there and stared at me for what felt like hours. It scared the hell out of me. Finally, he retreated back into the darkness of the room and I just kept sitting there. I was too afraid to turn my back on him again. So I sat there and stayed like that all the way until sunrise. And then when it was light out, I snuck back across the parking lot, still in just my underwear, more scared than embarrassed. I wedged open the door with a chair so it wouldn't shut on me, threw open the curtains, packed and threw some clothes on as fast as I could. All the dolls and figurines were back where they were supposed to be, and I didn't see that thing again. I wanted to write it all off as some kind of lucid dream, but my ankle was bruised. Bruised exactly where that thing grabbed me, and my skin was raw and tender and would scab up a bit over the next few days. Also, if I had just been dreaming, that would mean that I had to have sleepwalked out to my car, right? 
but I have never sleepwalked a single time in my entire life, not before or since. It was real. It had to be. I guess I got what I wanted. Sounds terrible. Oh my God, yeah. I was just picturing you. Like, oh, I'm so brave, I'm so tough, clowns don't really bother me anymore. That happens to you? Oh yeah, I would lose my mind. And specifically, it being clowns, it would be next level. Yeah, yeah, I would would legit be traumatized. Yeah, it would be a (laughs) lot of therapy. Yeah, I don't I don't even know if that would work. I mean, I well, mean yeah, maybe could, it would. You could EMDR your way through it. Yeah, I would want to like have that memory purged from my brain, I think, somehow. Hypnosis? Yeah, maybe. Again, actually. EMDR, actually. Yeah, yeah. I have some pictures of this very weird place. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> uh, this is an aerial view of the totally normal Clown Motel and a good portion of Tonopah behind it. It just stands out like a sore thumb. You know, these like bright yeah. primary colors pop so distinctly against the backdrop of Mm -hmm. the desert. Yeah. It's definitely the main attraction, I would say, now of this little town. Um, Here's a few clown dolls, paintings, and figurines you can find in the lobby. Oh, my God. That is terrible. (laughs) Holy bejesus. That, the... Oh God, the clown, I cannot look at it. The one sitting, uh-huh. the big one the in big between one in the two middle. chairs. Yep. Yep. Has a, its face. It's not even Uncanny Valley. I mean, yeah. maybe it is. I don't know. I think, it's just, I th- what, what's the words I want? Yeah. It's, yeah, it is so creepy. It, I think that one moved on that Ghost Adventures uh, episode. Oh, even look at its hand. Uh huh. I mean, this photo feels like someone is wearing a clown costume. Right, right, right. Yep. Oh, my which, God. Which I guess is possible. Somebody could have posed oh. for this photo and we just don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's a doll. It shows up in other people's photos too. But that did make me think like, man, if you really wanted to get somebody, replace the doll with a person one day. Oh, my God. And have them be still. And when somebody goes for a picture, just scream in the rear, grab them. Or just just a, I, I, honestly, <laughs> what I think is better is slight movements. Oh, yeah. Just little movements. And just yeah. a little bit, a little bit, a little uh-huh. bit. And then you go for the big thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, uh, next picture is room 108. What it looks like these days. Just, oh my God. Just a little painting of Pennywise right next to your bed. That is awful. Okay. So for those of you listening and not looking at photos right now, it's like a, a double queen room uh-huh. and you know, it has the like cheap looking, uh, duvet, not even like du- duvet cover, but those sort of like yeah. plastic feeling, uh, comforters uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that are exactly. always at motels. Yep, right. Yep. And then. Just in the corner, like a... It's a full wall. A f- it, well, it's a half wall. But it's oh, a f- half wall, yeah. Yeah, but it's a full painting of yeah. Pennywise with the balloon and the little kid in the yellow uh, raincoat. Yep, uh, yep. D- just imagine if you could actually fall asleep and then you <laughs> roll over. Because, you know, sometimes uh-huh. you forget where you are. Uh-huh. Like you're just disoriented. Yeah. I would be a wreck. Yeah. I'm never staying here. <laughs> uh, this next uh, photo, this is uh, a guest just, you know, having a good time in room 111. Oh my God, what is this about? <laughs> That's some, some lady wearing a mask and doing that weird back bend. Um, you see like people do like a little spider crawl in horror movies sometimes. Okay, th- what she should have done to make this better is uh-huh. churn the mask. Oh, flip it around so it looks like her head's out. Yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because uh-huh. yeah. I immediately was like, well, I can look at the mask and I can see her pale legs. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It doesn't like, yeah. But just Still more, creepy. more creepy clown photos, uh, paintings. And then just one more, just a photo of the motel's exterior at night. Yikes. No way. <laughs> no right. way. You're like driving. You're like, man, we're so tired. Let's pull uh-huh. off. You see like the sign on the freeway that's like lodging ahead. You're like, okay, whatever. Yeah. This is what you come upon? Oh, yeah. I would, There's I would, no way. No. Not, not if you're just randomly driving through. I'd be like, nope. Uh-uh. We're going to keep driving. Nope. I'd rather sleep in my car. <laughs> Uh, this pic comes from the website amyscrypt.com, which is actually a really cool website uh, where a woman named Amy explores haunted sites all over the world and posts pictures, blogs, and videos of what she finds. Oh, that's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's been doing it for years. Um, I don't think that I have shared this story yet, but oh, it, because I, uh, yeah, I have so many like in the can, so I'm confused yeah. about what I've told or what I've just prepped. Sure. But have I told a story recently about some little figurines? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. I think it's forthcoming. And so when you were talking about the little clown figurines being like watching the show that was maybe going to happen to Doug 1976, Uh I was uh like, oh my God, I have another like, oh, so strange and creepy. Okay. Also, do you think that um, love syndicates are the original sugar babies? (laughs) 
<laughs> I was just like, what is happening here? Yeah, like looking for a sugar daddy. Well, it's, God, it's, it's so funny to it, me. It sounds like I didn't dig into uh, you know a lot of details, but it sounds like that you know there was like you know courting norms back then. Yeah. And if they were presenting themselves as ladies of high society, there would be like these men who would be courting them, and gifts would be part of, part of the courting process. And it sounds very much like they led them on in some way that they were worried about facing criminal charges mm -hmm. or like getting like, I don't know, some kind of courting gifts that were supposed to be for somebody who truly intended to be on their way to marriage. Yeah. And then they just had numerous guys they kept doing that to over and over and just racking up. I mean, $100,000 back then, you know, in the early 20th century, that's millions now. I mean, it was cracking me up though. Yeah. Okay. Two other things quickly. Yeah. The guy who stayed in 210 with the back pain and then stayed there for six, <laughs> six years. years. I feel like there was something there like keeping him drawn there. Oh, yeah. And maybe maybe a gentle possession, you know, where he didn't maybe act any different or whatever, but like oh, yeah. it just wouldn't let him go or, you know, Very strange. gotten into his psyche. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you die huh? and our children want to have a hotel in your honor. Oh, what, I see, yeah. What kind of hotel would it be? I mean, it's not a clown hotel because what a no. strange thing that these kids like started the clown motel for their dead dad. <laughs> I don't know because I don't know if I'd want to do something serious just like I mean I don't really care that much about hotels like some like nice thing if I was going to do one as a weird joke um, well it's not you doing it it's like what would the kids do in your honor right right as like um, I mean maybe a bad magic uh, motel where there would just be like things from the shows throughout it I don't think our kids care about bad magic no enough. they don't they don't no I think it is like a series of stories Stupid practical jokes. They huh. like you can see coming, but just give the kids so much joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the walls are plastered with 0.5 photos of you. <laughs> that is our kids. The 0.5 motel. Anybody who's got uh, teenage kids or like tweens, or, yeah. I, don't, I guess even into the early 20s, I'm sure that your kids are doing it and they take the most horrific most photos. Most unflattering. Oh, God, they're so funny. I mean, that's what they're going for. Just like the more unflattering, the better. Uh -huh. And then they'd make stickers out of it. And yeah. then, you know, uh, yeah, text you with those. Mm -hmm. Yep. And everybody's a victim, including myself, Grandma Betty, mm -hmm. the dogs. Like, no one is off limits. Yep, yep. But you are their favorite. Yeah, they got a lot of horrific photos of me. So I just imagine a hotel with a lot of those photos. And yeah. then stupid, like, whoopee cushion. And, like, just really <laughs> <Yeah>. dumb stuff. <laughs> uh, you ready to leave the Clown Motel and head to a haunted area just outside of Washington, D.C.? Yeah, let's go. A little bit of interesting historical setup. I actually really... Uh, interesting historical setup uh, with his second story before jumping into the paranormal claims. Politics, as we all know, is a volatile field. More than creating real change in the exchange of ideas, politics today often seems like nothing more than an endless cycle of televised feuds and discussions that aren't really discussions as much as they are just two politicians yelling over and over at each other or cheerleading to their base. But as unprofessional and belligerent as these modern debates can seem, there was a time when things were quite a bit worse, when the proverbial bloodbath of political disputes was not proverbial. In the United States during the 17th and 18th centuries, instead of hurling verbal insults at one another, politicians would frequently resolve their issues like gentlemen, that is to say, with a gentlemanly duel. I kind of love this. <laughs> Northeast of Washington, D.C., in, what uh, in what is now the town of Colmar Manor, Maryland, Near the local IHOP on 38th Street, and next to a quaint little trickle of water called Deer Creek, sits a small strip of unassuming grassy parkland with a wooden gazebo in its center. It's a good place to read a book, take your dog for a walk, to enjoy the summer sun, but if you look a little closer, you'll find it was once also a place where many came prepared to die. Next to the sidewalk on the far end of the park, a metal sign reads, dueling grounds. Mm -hmm. On this site, now part of the Anacostia River Park, more than 50 duels were fought during the first half of the 19th century. Here, on what became known as the Dark and Bloody Grounds, gentlemen of Washington settled their political and personal differences. The first duel uh, to bloody this land took place in 1808 and was between New York Representative Berent Gardinier and Tennessee Representative George W. Campbell. It was about a disagreement regarding Thomas Jefferson's embargo on trade with Great Britain and France. This duel left no fatalities, but Gardinier was seriously wounded when he was shot. Another famous duel took place in 1836. This time it was fatal. It ended with the death of 22-year-old Daniel Key, son of American poet, lawyer, and author Francis Scott Key. And what cause did he die for? A disagreement between himself and a fellow Naval Academy midshipman over how fast steamboats could go. 
<laughs> That's so stupid. <laughs> yep. However trivial or profound the controversy between gentlemen might be, back then it was of the utmost importance that while dueling, they adhere to a formalized set of rules and etiquette. The first rule was that the duel would only take place in order to settle, quote, affairs of honor, meaning the disagreement had to be over something noble and virtuous. Not sure how steamboat speed qualified, but okay. Second rule was that men must agree upon when the duel should end, which would be until one of them was injured, could no longer fight, or was dead. The gentleman must also face off with similar weapons, and during this period, the most common of these weapons was the pistol. The last formal duel fought at the Dark and Bloody Grounds was in 1868 between the U.S. Minister to Costa Rica, Albert Lawrence, and the Secretary of the German Legation, Heinrich von Kusero, over something said about Lawrence's wife. Neither man was wounded on this occasion. Since 1868, the land has slowly transformed from a field of honor, where gentlemen punctuated their arguments with bullets, to a peaceful patch public, uh, of public parkland for all to enjoy. Well, mostly peaceful. Although in life they felt their cause was worth dying for, in death, some of the spirits of the slain gentlemen of the dark and bloody grounds are said to still linger, tormented by their own hubris and pride. For over 150 years now, foggy figures of uninformed and elegantly dressed men of bygone ages have occasionally been witnessed roaming the park, ghastly and silent. Unlike most ghosts we've encountered here on Scared to Death, who appear to the living only in the dead of night, the spirits that haunt the dark and bloody grounds seem to only ever manifest when the sun is just beginning to rise above the sullen, misty land. Which makes sense if these spirits are indeed those of men who once dueled. Dawn was the, was the traditional time for gentlemen's duels to take place. According to reports, some of these spirits still hold their dueling pistols languidly by their sides, their blurry faces congealed into a perpetual state of dissent, hate, and regret, piercing the morning air around their formless bodies. Others limp pitifully across the parkland, one hand pressed against an open wound to prevent their shadowy blood from spewing onto the dewy grass, the other hand reaching desperately towards aid that will never come. Others, it seems, are frozen in time, spent reliving their final duel, dying at dawn, over and over and over again. In today's encounter claim, an anonymous man recounts his terrifying experience with one such spirit. Time now for the tale of the dark and bloody grounds. When this happened to me, I was an arrogant, stubborn, pompous 23-year-old living in a cramped three-bedroom Georgetown apartment with four roommates. I was halfway through my first year of law school and had developed an unmatched alcohol tolerance a penchant for picking up girls I just met that night, and an astounding ability to find cocaine nearly everywhere I went. I love this guy. <laughs> I had more passion back then for life, for school, for work, and oddly enough, I had faith, more faith too, far more than I did in my 30s and infinitely more than I do now. Back then, I even believed that politics was the most honorable field a man could go into, and that I was destined for a glorious and profound career in it. I was also a real douchebag in those days, <laughs> as were my friends. Just keep that in mind as I tell you the rest of this story. In mid-January of 1998, my roommates Mason, Brock, Daniel, Tucker, and I made the 40-ish minute trek from Georgetown to Brentwood for our friend Felicity's housewarming party. We had known Felicity for almost five years at that point, the first two of which she and I had spent sleeping together off and on. Now she was engaged to this criminal defense lawyer 10 years older than she was, Rick. I fucking hated Rick. But not because he was a criminal defense lawyer and pro-lobbyist, although that did not help. I hated him because I was jealous. Even though I was the one who ended things our sophomore year when she asked me if we could take our fuck buddy relationship to the next level, I still thought Felicity should have ended up with me and not that douchebag Rick. Like I said, I was an asshole. And the night of this party, I was an especially drunk asshole. So when Rick was telling us his opinion about the recent news of President Clinton's affair with Monica Lewinsky, I immediately and aggressively took the opposition. I think we need to wait until Lewinsky gives her deposition in the Paula Jones lawsuit before we jump to any conclusions about what she's actually guilty of, said Rick coolly. It was almost 3 a.m., and most of the housewarming party attendees had already dissipated into the night. The only people left were our core friend group from undergrad, plus old man Rick, as Brock called him. Felicity had her arm wrapped around Rick's waist and was nodding enthusiastically at every word he said. I took a long swig of vodka soda. My face was hot and my head was buzzing. Listen, man, if she was guzzling Slick Willie, Slick Willie, then she's definitely guilty of something. I laughed and I looked around the room expectantly, but no one else was laughing. I shrugged and knocked back the rest of my drink. 
At that point, I'd lost count of how many I'd guzzled down. Screw you guys, I added, doubling down on a clearly unpopular opinion. Lewinsky's a slut, and we all know it. Did you see her picture in the paper? Jesus, Alexander, Felicity exclaimed. Could you be any more sexist? She's a fucking intern, and he's the president of the United States. You're just going to ignore that absolutely insane power dynamic? Don't you think your man Clinton deserves at least some of the blame? She was the one who wore that skirt in the White House, I said, slurring my words and looking as directly as I could at my ex. You used to have a skirt like that, didn't <gasps> you, Felly? Fury blazed in her dark eyes. I snorted. Get the fuck out of my house, Rick demanded, in what I assumed to be his lawyer voice. With pleasure, I stood and bowed. Looking back, I cringe at how obnoxious and embarrassing and childish my behavior was. But in that drunken moment, it felt completely justified. I felt like Rick deserved it. And my ego told me that Felicity deserved it too. I swiped the last unopened beer can off the coffee table, donned my heavy black coat, and sauntered out the door. Once I was on the sidewalk and the cold January air hit my face, I realized the mistake I just made. Not being a dick, that I still felt good about. I realized that I didn't have a way to get home. I turned back towards the porch, half expecting to see Daniel, who had volunteered to DD that evening, exiting the house with his car keys in his hand, ready to tell me how right and brave I was to call Monica Lewinsky a slut. He was not. No one was. No one had rallied to my cause. They were all still inside, probably talking shit about me. Furious, I stomped down the road. Goddamn suburbs, I thought, cursing the lack of taxis and excess space between houses. With no destination in mind and a potent mix of indignant indignation and alcohol fueling my stride, I wandered for what felt like miles in the cold. Eventually, I came across a small, unimpressive swath of public park. There was a gazebo in the middle that beckoned me like a moth to a flame, so I stumbled towards it. My head had been spinning and my stomach in lurches since I stormed out of Felicity's, so I was happy to take a sit somewhere that wasn't a curb. From, my, uh, from the wooden, old wooden bench, I surveyed the desolate park. And for the first time that night, I felt a quiet whisper of guilt creep up my spine. But then I remembered what a douchebag Rick was and how pretty Felicity had looked in her pink sweater and that feeling went away. I decided my best course of action was to wait there until the public buses started to run at 6 a.m., which I assumed to be pretty soon. At least I hoped it was. I wasn't wearing a watch and this was a bit before I got my first cell phone. Time was slow, my head sluggish, and my stomach sour. I felt like vomiting, but pride forced me to swallow the bile. And as exhausted as I was, pride also prevented me from laying down on a park bench like some hobo in DuPont Circle on a Saturday night. I don't know how long I sat there, stewing in my own righteousness and convincing myself that everyone else was the problem, but eventually the sun began to meekly rise, dully illuminating the gray fog that burdened the small patch of land. The street lamps were still glowing orange, and the sky was still clinging to the night. A harsh gust of wind barreled through the barren trees. The sound made me flinch. I was unexpectedly overwhelmed with an illogical, unsettling feeling that I shouldn't be there, that what, I was, that what was about to unfold was something I shouldn't see. But I didn't leave. My curiosity kept me where I was, and I waited. The world felt like it had been violently shaken, rattling like a sack of teeth and bones and tipped on its side, emptied out, all the dead things inside clattering onto the frozen dirt below. I froze. Not knowing why, I listened for footsteps. When I heard none, I waited. Then, without warning, a brutal, inhuman scream pierced through the morning's air's swollen skin. I snapped my head to the left and looked for the source of the sound. There was nothing. My heart was pounding out of my chest. My stomach felt like it was bubbling over with boiling acid, and my brain was throbbing and revolting inside my skull. Bad combination of being afraid and the beginning of a brutal hangover. I was frantically searching the dying darkness for the screaming thing when, again, the strange sound resonated throughout the empty park and vacant streets. I started laughing. It was the sound of a motorcycle speeding down some distant road. I shook my head at how ridiculous I was being and felt an odd sense of superiority for outsmarting fear. Again, I looked at the empty park. But now it was no longer empty. A man was standing in the middle of the fog-laden field, no more than five or six feet in front of the gazebo, and he was holding a gun. In that moment, fear pulverized my inebriated mind and bludgeoned my mighty ego into a fine, mushy pulp. I have never felt so exposed. I've never known such terror. Would this be the end of me? Was he about to turn and shoot? I held my breath. The man looked shorter than me, and though he was shrouded in fog and facing away from where I sat in the gazebo, I could tell he was wearing a weirdly formal military uniform that I didn't recognize. Still drunk, I felt certain that he had dressed up for the occasion of murdering me. It made some kind of strange sense at the time. 
I blinked hard at the hazy figure and the gun in his right hand. It looked like an old-timey pistol, the kind you'd only ever see in museums or old westerns. I would have been perplexed by that if I wasn't so fucking scared. And then abruptly, he started walking. Well, more like marching. I waited with stifled breath while he took what must have been 20 or so brisk steps forwards and hoped against hope that he would continue doing so until he reached the road and then farther still. But he didn't. When he reached the end of his invisible path, the uncanny man abruptly swung around, aimed his pistol at the gazebo, inside which I still sat, and fired. I collapsed onto the ground and threw my arms over my head. Out of the corner of my eye, I watched as the man suddenly crumpled to the ground, writhing in pain, his spine-chilling form contorting in grotesque ways until eventually it stopped and he was still. I squeezed my eyes shut. I felt hot tears stream down my chapped cheeks and hotter bile dribbling out of my mouth onto the paint chip splintering floorboards. I was too afraid to move, so I remained still and tried to quietly mentally assess my body for wounds. I felt nothing. Cautiously, I lifted my head. His body was gone. I struggled quickly to my feet and wiped my mouth with the back of my hand. I stared at the spot where he had just been, the spot where he had most certainly died. But there was no body, no corpse, no pool of blood, nothing. After spending roughly an eternity gaping dumbfounded around the park with no idea what else to do, I staggered out of the gazebo. By then the sun was fully up and the streetlights had been turned off. Confused and sinking deeper into the sweltering molasses of an early morning hangover, I made my way down the road closest to the gazebo. As I stumbled past the spot where the man had fired his pistol, the spot where he had fallen dead, I realized something. I never heard a gunshot. I felt sicker than ever and quickened my pace. I couldn't comprehend what I just witnessed, and I didn't really even want to. I just wanted to be home. When I reached the sidewalk on the other side of the street from the park, I turned around to take one last look at where I'd sat and witnessed such a strange and upsetting sight. And he was there, standing in front of the gazebo with pistol in hand, staring at me. And then he started to march forward again. Dang. <laughs> I really liked him at the beginning. I know. He said he was a dude back. He was right. <laughs> really funny writer. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm mm -hmm. sure that he's a very different person now, just mm -hmm. like the way that he calls himself out. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, all those things check out. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. young. Yep. 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 <laughs> God. I, I was hoping that yeah. at the end he was going to say, and Felicity did not marry Rick. I made things right. And oh, I got the girl. Yeah. 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 I was rooting uh, for him to get his shit together. Uh-huh. Who knows? Maybe he did. Huh? Well, he probably would have said something. Probably not. Sense. Oh God, that is a, that's a great story because I can really yeah. imagine, Yeah, you know, that sort of like hazy, I'm drunk, but like, oh, I need to pull it together to get mm -hmm. home. You know, it's just a very specific headspace. Yeah. Yeah. And then seeing something like that, you would be like, my God, am I that drunk? Am I hallucinating? Am yeah. I about to black out? Like, yeah. yeah. And then to like see that figure, do the march, the whole thing, and then essentially witness him start to do it all over again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Aye, aye, aye. Ichiwawa. Uh, I have some pictures. Okay. A couple of them here. This uh, first one is the metal sign at Anacostia River Park, describing okay. the history of the dark and bloody grounds. Uh, yeah, just a little little park in this neighborhood. It's, yeah, it's so random. Mm -hmm. uh, this next one is a photo of the dark and bloody grounds uh, showing where the duels once took place, taken in 1943. So would they take... Just on that Place field on there, that, like, just uh, in the middle of all those trees. Uh -huh, yep, uh -huh. they just march apart from each other or whatever rules that, they like, set. like strip in the middle? Uh-huh. Okay. And sometimes, yeah, sometimes they would shoot until like they, they would just call it off. Like I think I think they would do a round, mm -hmm. like they'd each shoot. Mm -hmm. And then there was like the the option to opt out after that. After, after one shot? After, yeah, after you fired those shots. That's why some people like never were wounded. Got they, it. And, I, and I've read stories about, you know, other duels where, yeah, sometimes they would do multiple rounds. Neither person hit, and, I, and then I think like the reality would start to sink in of like, what are we doing? Uh huh. How, why? Why? Why are we keeping? You know, why are we continuing to do this? Yeah. And they would just, I don't know, agree to disagree or like something. Yeah. I, I do kind apologize. Of, I don't know. I do kind of have a strange like respect for it. I do too. Yeah. Because it's like if you really truly believe in yeah. something, mm -hmm. like are you like how? Okay, I mean like just our political climate is so tumultuous it's like it's like but okay uh -huh. if you're on this side of the issue you've got this side and you've got that side it's like yeah how serious are you well and, and i just like when i think about it i think about how much more respectful uh yeah. people were in certain situations back then mm -hmm. because the consequences were so much greater right essentially like, there are no consequences now. yeah it's like that's why the internet is such a shit show yep. in, in most places 
And it's it altered people's behavior. And I feel like, you know, people have less etiquette and manners in public than ever before. Oh, yeah. There's endless studies about there, it. Yeah, because there's no consequences. Yeah. And, and in fact, if you choose to shame them, a lot of times the, uh, the, the social media will turn on you. Right. Like, how dare you uh, choose to insult this person? Just uh, that's just they're living their, their life. Uh huh. And it's like, what I love about this is like, oh, yeah, you know, you could say something, you could smart off about somebody's wife, and they'll be like, all right, motherfucker, let's duel. <sighs> And, and then it was a huge shame if you refused and you look like a big coward. Right. And it's like, but just knowing that someone could say that to you made you say a lot less. Well, I think it's sort of that thing of like, um, you know, we don't want to parent from a place of fear. And, right. and I, I do believe that. Yeah. But there is that thing of like a healthy dose of like, I want our kids to be just a little bit nervous yeah. to, to, to do something wrong because they know that there will be consequences. I don't want right. them to be afraid to come to us and be like, hey, I, I really fucked up. That's not what yep. I'm saying. But I'm, it's yeah. like, there were certain situations that I absolutely found myself in well into like my mid twenties. I was like, yeah, oh, okay, if I do this yeah, and it doesn't go X, Y, Z way and I have to call my parents for money, for an explanation, yeah. whatever. It's like, I'm going to be so embarrassed and they're yep. going to be so ashamed of me, yep. so disappointed. It didn't necessarily always stop me. <laughs> right, right, right. But at yeah. least like I had some concept of consequence. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I love that in the last few years, it has felt so good to have moments individually with just Kyler or just Monroe when mm -hmm. we're out somewhere mm -hmm. and they see someone mm -hmm. acting like a dipshit, child or grown up. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, we, and we've had that conversation of like, that's why we didn't let you guys get away with everything. Right. So you wouldn't become that person. And they totally get it now. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, it does feel good. Because I, I always think about like, if everybody did that or some mm -hmm. version of that, society would be way better for everybody. Possibly. I, way, I would way hope more so. Civil. I way hope more so. civil. I hope so. Um, Carry on. Yeah, sorry. Actually, last thing I wanted to say on that is uh, just really quick. I learned, you know, not to take things too far or to like to have limits for my joking. When I was a kid, I think I've said this before, but it's been a while, but I got punched in the face quite a few times. <laughs> and every single time that I can remember, like these, you know, like, uh, like grade school and junior high, um, deserved it. Yeah. I, I, I was pushing somebody. I was being a little dick. Yeah. And eventually they couldn't take it and they popped me in the mouth or hit me in the eye or whatever. And it definitely changed my behavior. Because mm -hmm. then I was like, okay, maybe not take things that far. Yeah. <laughs> um, next really what you needed was a big brother. I know, just to smack me around. Uh-huh. Uh, this, ne this next photo is of the dark... Oh, wait. <laughs> this next one is of an old newspaper cartoon of the last duel at the Dark and Bloody Grounds. Duel between Baron something something. And you know what's so crazy? Oh yeah, that was between Albert Lawrence and uh uh oh my gosh, or excuse me, one of the men, Albert Lawrence, the guy there um holding the pistol that's smoking. Uh-huh. If you really look at the photo, his left arm, it's uh, it looks like his sleeve is just tucked into his shirt. This guy did a duel oh. three years after getting shot in the arm and losing the arm in a civil war battle. Dang. So he knew the consequences of like he lost an arm in a previous battle, and he was like, Nope. Still going to duel. My gosh. <laughs> I don't want to give anything away, but talking about losing limbs. I have one more picture too. Oh, we're watching uh, Fall Down. <laughs> <What? laughs> fall Out, yeah. Fall Out. And Oof. Yeah. It's last last night, that like, you know what I'm uh -huh, talking about? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, and then here is a Google Street View screenshot of the gazebo where the anonymous man claimed to have seen the ghost of oh, a former man. dueler. I just. At dawn. Yeah, that would be such an intense experience. Uh-huh. So intense. Okay. Also, I really liked that all of his friends have the waspiest names ever. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Brock. Uh -huh. like, oh, okay, Brock and Felicity. <laughs> all right, upper echelon. <laughs> oh, okay, well, those were really fun. Okay, I thanks. Mean, the clown story. I'm still thinking about clowns. Creepy, creepy. I feel like they're going to pop up in my dreams tonight. Mm. You know? It's just like those were really good visuals. Okay. Who's your, oh, you're taking a drink. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I got a blue one. Blue Layla. Okay, well, I hope you and Blue Layla are ready to go for a little ride. We are. Let's go. Hello, Queen of Bad Magic and Master of the Suck. Hello, hello. We are a blended family. My wife has two boys from her first marriage, and I have one from mine. Her oldest son, Brayden, age nine, predominantly lives with his biological father, and the eldest, I'm sorry, and the youngest, Edward, and my son, Arthur, respectively five and eight, live with us. Our youngest has a myriad of health issues related to being born premature with underdeveloped lungs. With both of us working in healthcare during the times of COVID-19, I'm a paramedic and she's a nurse's aide, we had sent him to stay with his bio dad for a while in the event that we were exposed to the virus at work as it would likely prove fatal if he were exposed. 
He started living with us again full time about a week ago. Obviously, this is a yeah. previously sentenced story. As our area was largely spared from the full impact of the pandemic. All of that is important because during the time he was gone, his room sat empty with the door closed and the dogs out. Also, during that time, we'd begun to make a date night out of listening to st- listening to Scared to Death together at home. We're both non-denominational Christians and have been fairly steadfast in our faith, but we believe in things lurking in the dark and they are even referenced in scripture. We believe that to be a Christian and to believe in the Judeo-Christian God, it requires that we acknowledge there are evil forces in the world as well. I also believe that for kids and animals, the veil is thinner. Lastly, I believe that if you seek out dark entities, they will become more attracted to you. We rent a ranch-style home on about eight acres in a fairly Mm. rural area. Our landlord is an elderly man whose parents previously owned the home. They both died very peaceful, natural deaths in the house. And I don't believe that what we are dealing with is our landlord's parents. I'm almost confident that they have passed on without any hiccups. We've only been experiencing weird things in the last couple of weeks. When Ed came home from living with his biological father, he steadfastly refused to enter his room without the lights on, much less sleep in his room. We attributed this to nerves from the change in circumstances and lack of stability during the difficult times of the virus. We let him sleep on the bottom bunk in Arthur's room for the night. Arthur wasn't super stoked about the idea of having to share a room with his younger brother for no good reason, but he did accept it. The next night, We were watching a friend's four-year-old son, Ray, meaning someone was going to have to sleep in the other bedroom. Three boys, three beds. Ed still refused to sleep in the room even after supportive coaxing, bartering, outright telling him he was going to sleep in his own room. We gave him a little more latitude than we normally may have because he had been away from us for so long. Plus, we didn't want to deal with him crying all night. We asked Arthur if he would mind sleeping in Ed's room for the night. Arthur was fine with it. He didn't want to sleep in the room with the younger boys anyways. We finally got them all to bed, sleeping by about 9.30. We went to bed and woke up to all four of our dogs going absolutely apeshit at 2.30 a.m. I grabbed the home defense gun and went to investigate, turning on all the lights as I went. I checked the rooms and all three of the kids were sound asleep as if they hadn't heard the dogs barking. Nothing in the house seemed to miss. I double-checked the doors and the windows, and they were all locked as they had been before I'd gone to bed. I attributed the dog's outburst to a deer or some other animal that must have wandered into the yard. The next morning, when Arthur woke up, he said he never wanted to sleep in Ed's room ever again. He said it smelled funny, and the other kids wouldn't let him, sp- wouldn't let him sleep, despite the other boys having been in a completely separate bedroom. He wouldn't explain any further, staring at the floor and avoiding more questions. I wrote this off as an overactive imagination. While I believe in the spoopy things in the dark corners around the world, I also don't go running to apply supernatural meaning to every weird thing Hmm. one of our kids says. Like Dan said in the Girl Scout murder episode of Time Suck, you'd never sleep if you deeply investigated every strange noise a little kid said they heard. Yeah. That night, we were still watching Ray when bedtime came around. Arthur stood by his decision that he absolutely was not sleeping in Ed's room again. Ed whined a little bit, but got into his own bed. However, after we had said goodnight, given hugs, and turned off the lights, he started crying inconsolably. We asked him what was wrong, and he said he was scared. We made sure he had a nightlight on, told him it would be okay, gave more hugs, he stopped crying, and we left the room closing the door behind us. As soon as the door closed, the inconsolable bawling started again. We opened the door to see what the problem was this time, and again, Ed said he was scared. The other two boys were already in bed and fast asleep, so we asked if he wanted one of the dogs to sleep in his room with him. He picked our 14-year-old lab, Gage, but Gage refused to go into the bedroom, which wasn't that abnormal as the dogs had been trained to not go in the, the kid's room. The only dog that would go into the room was our Pembroke Welsh Corgi named Monster. (laughs) Ed, satisfied that he had a Corgi guardian for the night, settled in and closed his eyes. Again, we closed the door and this time no crying. Relieved, my wife and I went to bed ourselves. And then around 2.30 a.m., we were woken by a crash and the distinct snarl and bark of an extremely pissed off Corgi, followed by a yelp and another string Mm. of Corgi barks and snarls. We ran to Ed's room to find his toy box upturned and toys everywhere. 
Ed was fast asleep, but Monster was staring at the closet next to the toy box, hackles raised, a small but noticeable trickle of blood coming from the corner of his mouth, absolutely losing his ever-loving shit. I threw the door of the closet open, ready to murder whomever had just broken into my kid's room, but found nothing. We woke up Ed, checking him for wounds, fearing Monster may have snapped at him in his sleep and that that was where the blood had come from. It would have it would have been out of character, but if Ed had been asleep and kicked him or something, I don't know. I was trying to rationalize where the blood was coming from, but Ed was completely fine. I soothed the corgi and checked his mouth. No source of blood, but the blood in the fur around his mouth was still wet and warm. There's only one door and one window in Ed's room. The door had been closed and the window was locked. If someone of our world had been in the room, there would have still been, they would have still been in the closet. There's no way they could have gotten out of that room without being noticed. Now I'm sure somewhere in the last few paragraphs, Lindsay was thinking something like, get the fuck out. <laughs> we are moving in the middle of the next month for completely unrelated reasons. I'm not a Darren. Anyways, Ed wanted to go back to sleep, saying he wanted Monster to leave. I didn't mention earlier, but Ed has difficulty speaking because he's almost completely deaf in one ear and hard of hearing in the other. He is understandable when he speaks, but anyone who's been around the hard of hearing community knows that their speech isn't exactly crystal clear. And that's kind of how Ed talks. But when he said, I want Monster to leave, it was clear as day. It was certainly Ed's voice, but it was unencumbered by the inability to hear himself speak. We asked him why, and Ed said, he hurt my friends. A chill ran down my spine. Something just wasn't right with this whole situation. We asked Ed if he would come sleep in our room, which we had absolutely never allowed our kids to do. My bedroom, my space. He said he didn't want to and rolled over and went back to sleep. I picked up Ed and moved him to our bedroom, despite him protesting as I did so, but we wanted him out of his room. I laid him down on a camping cot at the foot of our bed, brought all four dogs into our room, checked on the other boys, and then returned to bed for the night. The next morning, my wife asked Ed who his friends were. Ed said he didn't know what she was talking about. I asked him if he remembered waking up in the middle of the night, to which he said no. We went out on the front porch to discuss the matter away from the kids. There's something in that room, my wife and I agreed. I suggested we could go to the metaphysical shop in town, get some sage, and clear the house. I had already said multiple prayers between lying Ed down and going to bed myself and then when I woke up again that morning. I further suggested that if that didn't work, we could ask the pastor of the Methodist church we typically attended service at to come by and bless our home. My wife laughed at me with a strange look in her eyes and said, that's a load of bullshit anyways. <laughs> if God was real, why is there all this bad stuff in the world? We're all going to hell anyways. I was dumbfounded. She'd always been fairly spiritual. And while we aren't exactly the best Christians, we had both accepted God into our lives a couple of years prior. I stammered for a moment and then asked her, why would you say that? And she replied, because it's true, but I can see you're uncomfortable, so I'll stop talking about it now. And then she walked back into the house and didn't speak to me for hours. Later that day, as she was getting ready for work, I felt a heaviness come over the house. We had dropped the boys off with Ray's mother. She would be keeping them for a few days since I had to work a 24-hour shift the next day and my wife was going to be exhausted from her long shift. She was sitting on our bed, straightening her hair, when she suddenly stopped and looked at me so intensely it felt like she was boring into my soul. She said, don't sage the house without me. I want to be here for it. And when I asked her why, she said, I just really need to be here. I thought that interaction was a little weird, but I agreed to it. We both left the house shortly thereafter, my wife going to work and I to the metaphysical shop to pick up the sage. When I walked into the shop to pick up the sage, the clerk looked at me intently from across the sh shop and said, you're troubled. And, and I asked, why do you say that? She told me that I had a dark energy lurking just out of sight, but she knew how to fix it. She handed me a bundle of sage and when I reached for my wallet, she said, don't even worry about it. I got home around 3 p.m. and that heavy feeling around the house persisted. I felt that I should sage the house, but I had promised my wife we would do it together. So I sat on the front porch for a couple of hours, chain smoking cigarettes and reading my pocket Bible. I wasn't scared of anything, but it seemed like the thing to do. I went to bed early that night and as I turned out the lights in my room, a chill settled over me. I brought our Aussie shepherd Roscoe into my room and let him on the bed. 
Fluffy dog comfortably snuggled up against my leg. I drifted off to sleep. At about 2.30 in the morning, I woke to a cacophony of noise. Roscoe was promptly losing his shit. There was a scurrying sound all over my room, like a million rodents all scampering in the walls all at once. When I opened my eyes, the room was filled with at least 20 distinct shadowy outlines. Get out! I screamed over the barking dogs. You are not welcome here. Move on! And then all the noise ceased. The shadowy figures seemed to all turn directly towards me and then merged into one, forming what I can only describe as a slender man with a white face Uh. hunched over in the corner of my room. I rocketed out of bed, flipped on the light switch as I ran from the room, terrified, hitting every light on the way throughout the house out to the porch. I went to my car and grabbed the sage. Cautiously, I crept through my own front door. I lit the sage and repeated what I had said, trying to keep my voice firm and unwavering. Get out. You're not welcome here. Move on. While floating the smoke into every corner of our house. I spent extra time in Ed's room, burning almost half the bundle just in that room alone. Finally, I walked around my room, wafting the sage smoke into all the corners, the closet, and then I came to the corner where the figure had consolidated and my blood ran cold. On the floor, I found a small, pool of blood about the circumference of a coffee mug, still fresh, still warm. I went to the kitchen and got a roll of paper towels and a bottle of Fabuloso to clean up the blood. I also grabbed the Sam's sized kosher salt shaker Mm -hmm. we kept in the spice rack and sprinkled a little salt behind me as I went, being sure to sprinkle a line across the thresholds of every doorway I passed and the one to my bedroom. When I returned to the corner where I had found the blood, it had simply disappeared. I woke up, lying on my floor at around 7 a.m. I had to be at work in an hour, and the commute alone was 35 minutes. I hadn't heard any of my alarms go off. I scrambled to get a shower, get dressed, and get out the door on time. As I rushed out of the shower, I glanced at the fogged-over mirror where a single word was scrawled in condensation. Dogs. I'm not sure if this is coming from if this thing is coming from my dogs or for my dogs. <laughs> My wife and I have since resaged the house together and had the pastor over to bless the house. My wife doesn't even remember that conversation we had on the porch about religion being bullshit. She thinks I made that part up completely. Whatever it was that had been there or has been awoken, it started about a week after we'd been listening to the podcast in our house. Our pastor confirms that on occasion, if you call to an entity, it will respond to you. Rest assured, he thinks that our unconscious calling to the spirit or demon was what attracted it, but that the podcast may have made it feel mocked and possibly angry. Oh my God. He doesn't think the podcast itself would have called this entity in. It's been about four days since the shadow person sage blood night, and nothing has felt spooky or off about the house. We take extra safety measures to make sure the kids don't hear the podcast, including listening to it in the car together and praying <laughs> nightly for protection against oh evil God. entities for ourselves, yourselves, and all scared to death listeners and their families. Hmm. So far, so good. If anything changes, I'll let you know. I've got a new job several hours from where we live now, okay. and we signed the lease on our new home sometime this week, so we will, in fact, get the fuck out soon. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Oh, man. So many disturbing things in that story. That was a really creepy story. So strange. The blood disappearing. (sighs) And dogs, that's such a... uh, I like details like that Uh because, okay, if it was somebody manufacturing a story, you're not going to write dogs in the mirror. If if you're trying to write a scary story, you're not going to be like... uh, It it would be like, get out. Right, Or, or, you know, or uh, evil lurks here, not dogs. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, so I so I like that, uh, and then and then, God, that thing about um, in Ed's room uh-huh. when Monster, which is a great name for a dog, I love it. Monster the corgi is in there. The combination of hearing him upset about something, yelp, uh huh, and then blood in the mouth, yes, and staring at the closet. My mind went to like there's probably like a a cat or a squirrel, something. There's oh, an animal like a in critter. the closet, a critter in the closet. But then he looked in the closet. And you would hear that, or I, I would think that Matt would include a detail of like, well, we've had, uh, yeah, I, mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't even like, know what it would be. Well, like mouse droppings right. or something, but something. If it, but if it was a mouse, I mean, a corgi is going to destroy a mouse. If it catches it, yeah. 
it's not it's not gonna like bite the corgi on the lip and the corgi's then gonna like, you know, yeah. whimper. I mean, in all likelihood, it's just gonna like chomp it to death. Mm-hmm. So it'd have to be bigger than that. True. Which would require a decent sized hole for it to go into to get in and out of the house. That's very, very good points. So that like and I would think they'd been there long enough. I would think uh, you know, he might mention that uh, we've had problems with raccoons. Right. We live out in the or, country yeah, and like, something. you know, part of living in the country is critters in the house. And yeah. so, you know, it wasn't that surprising. No, there's no mention of anything like that. Yeah. Not a and Matt sounds like a around. really prepared, like, you know, mm-hmm. he understands that he lives in the middle of nowhere. So he's yeah. checking doors and windows every yeah. night. Out on eight acres. That's crazy. Yeah. Right. You know, he's got like a gun that he keeps by the bedside mm-hmm. table, which yeah. like, yes, all people can do that. But there is a specific kind of mentality when you live that far out, you've got to be yeah. just a bit more prepared. Because you have to know that, God forbid something happen, mm-hmm. help is not coming as fast as it would in other places. I know. That, that's why I think some people who don't live out in the country don't understand. when they Just some people who get like very worked up about like gun ownership in general. Mm-hmm. It's like, it, it is different. Yeah. If you're way out in the country and you have no one, no police are going to be there anytime soon. Right. If somebody, I think about that with my mom's place. Yeah, I was thinking that. You know, too. I mean, good luck because my stepdad is... Lo- loaded loaded and a real good <laughs> shot and your mom is a good shot <laughs> my mom is an even better shot i know it's wild uh huh but it's like yeah they're very vulnerable where it's like mm-hmm. you know if somebody were to sneak out to their house oh my god there's no one they're, they could scream all day long no one will hear them they're too far removed from anybody else mm-hmm. so it's like yeah you got to be pre- it does take a different kind of person I think to be able to handle it, who really prepares well, and, and also if you're yeah. like raised that way right like if yeah. you had chosen to continue to live outside of a populated town. Mm-hmm. It, it's not that, it doesn't feel mm-hmm. foreign to you. You're like, yeah, whatever, true. this is what I've done my whole life. Now, if you're someone like yeah. me who's born and raised in a city yeah. and then you move to the country, I'm everything. Oh, yeah, it's more scary for you. Well, yeah, I'm just constantly like, huh? What? Mm-hmm. A mouse might crawl into bed with me? Yeah. What? Yeah, there yeah, might be yeah. snakes in the house? Like that is so foreign to me. And and also because they're so remote, even more, even more reason for them to know if critters were around. Yes, yes, exactly. No, you know? yeah. It just feeds into more of like, what the hell? And I, oh, man. I, I do feel badly. Yeah. But it is kind of comical to me that this started after listening to Scared to Death in their house. I know. I'm like, I know. oh God. Because we have gotten various messages of like, hey, I don't know about that prayer. Hey, oh, I, yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. I don't know. It's a protection prayer. They're like, is it? I'm like, ah. Ooh, and, and oh, and then the, um, he said he went into that shop. I think he described it as like metaphysical, uh-huh. like like new age or you know whatever. Sure. But went in there and that was so creepy to have the lady not charge him for the sage mm-hmm. and say something to the effect of, I was just jotting down quick, but something like you have a dark entity just out of sight. Yeah. Like around you. Mm-hmm. Eh, like the combination of all the details in that story, that's a really, uh, that one really spooked. Like I still have the chills. Yeah. And I really like Matt's approach too. Like I appreciate him calling out early on that he's a non-denominational Christian. Mm, yeah. And, and, but then also is like, you know, salting doorways and. Hey man, you're gonna try everything. Exactly. And I appreciate that. Cause I think yeah. like we can get so one-sided like, well, this is what I do. This is who I am. This is what I believe. It's like bullshit. <laughs> you know, this shit's happening to you. You're trying everything. Don't, re- don't kid yourself. That reminds me of one of my most favorite quotes of all time. It's a Mike Tyson quote. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, it's a great one. He says, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Because <laughs> you talk about like these guys talking, you know, when he was in his prime, <sighs> talking shit about how they're going to tear him up. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Ma- make your plan. That plan's gone the second I punch you in the mouth. I love that. You know, because now you're just going to be scrambling to survive. Sure. And it's like, I think about that with like a thing like this. You could have this plan of like, well, if ghosts or uh, if there was something around me, I'm going to only do what my religion says I'm going to do. And that's it. No, yeah. You can think that. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, if you are terrified. Right. And your children and your or your children partner are at you're worried risk. for them. Yeah. Of course you're going to try everything to make this problem go away. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry guys. We're pretty chatty today. I think it's good chatty though. I like it. It's productive. I know, but also I'm aware of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm aware of that time. We talked for 17 minutes in between. Yeah, stories. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uno mas. Yeah. Okay. A little house sitting story. Let's do it. More, more scary houses. Okay. I was house sitting for my sister recently. The bottom floor of her house feels very creepy, so I never go down there, and even the animals won't go down there. My second or third night there, I had a dream. I was in the bedroom, getting ready for my day, when I had this strong feeling of being watched. I noticed a flashing red light that I hadn't seen before. When I got closer, I noticed it was a camera. I heard an urgent voice say, you need to wake up now. I looked around, and when I saw I was alone, I looked back to the camera trying to figure out who was watching me and for how long a voice shouted at me 
wake up. I woke up abruptly and heard what sounded like heavy footsteps running up the stairs. The vibe in the house didn't feel like it was a person of this world. The footsteps stopped at the top of the stairs, paused for a second, and then ran back down. The dogs woke up but didn't respond like they would have if someone was in the house. I could hear someone pacing at the bottom of the floor, at the bottom of the steps. I turned on the light and eventually I fell back asleep. The next night, I was having a dream of being chased through the woods. The sky was so dark, the moon was barely lighting up anything, and I heard a voice say, you're not safe, get up. And I woke up instantly. And again, it felt like something was in the room with me, but it was too dark to see anything. I told whatever it was that it needed to leave and go back downstairs. I swapped out the current crystal I was wearing (laughs) for selenite, slept with the light on, prayed for protection, burned Palo Santo throughout the house. I was trying to cover all my bases. I was thoroughly freaked out and I still had three weeks of house sitting left. A while after my sister and her family had returned, I had my nieces over for a sleepover. And at some point during the night, I saw the faint outline of something standing in front of my youngest niece as she slept on the couch. Before I could do anything, my older niece walked into the room, plopped down on the couch and said, Auntie, who's standing in front of sister? Like I said, I hadn't said a word. I hadn't indicated anything. She wasn't even in the room until right now. I asked if she could see it, and she said, No, but I can feel it. Just like I felt the thing that cousin brought into the house that you saw. That's why you asked me and sister to go out and play the other night, right? She was referring to an incident about seven months prior that I thought she knew nothing about. I asked my niece if she ever felt anything like this before, and she said every night, in the middle of the night, something wakes her up. She hears something walking down the stairs and that the footsteps are too loud to be moms and too fast to be dads. She said either the footsteps just stop, they go down into the downstairs living room, or she hears something walking around. Occasionally, it feels like something is standing in her doorway, but she can't see it. I told her what happened to me when I was house sitting, but it turns out she had been experiencing the exact same thing as me since before they had left for vacation. The creepy confirmation that it was Weird. not in your head. Right? Mm-hmm. For both parties. I know. I feel real bad for her niece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Each confirming the other person's suspicions. Yeah. Just like little kids, you know? Yeah. She probably is saying something to her parents. Like, I can't sleep. I'm scared. Mm-hmm. I hear footsteps. It's like, ah. No, Get out don't. of here. But then turns out you're right. I know. I would hate that. You know, when we go out of town, we have somebody stay with the dogs at our house. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I was just thinking, if she told us, like, oh my God, I would lose my mind. Because she stayed at our house so many times. Like, okay, we're headed out of town. Yeah. And if we come back from this trip and she's like, hey, I need to tell you something. But, but, but would it only really freak you out if it was something that you also had experienced to some level? Oh, like how I hear stuff in Kyler's room? Yeah, like 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 if it was just something random that you had never seen any of the nights that were there, would it bother you then? Because I mean, It would I, bother me either way, honestly, yeah. because she has stayed in our house so yeah. frequently over the years. Like every time we were like out for a stand-up date, mm-hmm. she was staying at our house. It's the same yeah. person for the last like, what, three years, four years? So if in yeah. all this time, like, she knows our house. She knows the sounds yeah. of our house. She's never said anything. An alarm has never tripped. Like, there's never been any incident. Yeah. If we come home after this trip and she's like, hey, something happened, I would yeah. be so freaked out because I mm. I know that she knows our house. I, I would only be, um, it's funny. Like, I, I don't think I would be that bothered. <gasps> I wouldn't be. You wouldn't? I, I, I would have to, uh, if I had had an inkling that there was something for me for it to really settle in. Mm-hmm. It would have to be like, okay, I'm working. Okay, like the other night, I was working on one of the Nightmare Fuel episodes, and I had to like stop the music. I was because I was by myself. You were out with a friend, and I was oh, yeah. uh, uh, I was at home, kind of blasting this creepy horror music and working on it. Uh huh. And I started to kind of freak myself out, and I'm okay. like, okay, okay, I have to stop. I thought I like I thought I saw something like down there, like by the mirror, like down what? the stairs. It was just because I was so worked up. Um. Was it? Yes, I think you so. Don't, you don't know that for sure? I don't know that for sure. But okay. You got to tell me these things. Like, God, I have to clear <laughs> the house. I keep meaning to. And this is, maybe but, I'm going to go home and do it right now. But let's say uh, that kept happening and I don't say anything. Sure. And I keep thinking I see something specific, you know, by one part of place house. Yeah. And then we come back from like being out of town. And then, you know, she says, tells us, hey, don't want to freak you out. 
what I think I saw and then proceeds to say exactly what I thought I was saying, oh that would scare the shit out of me. And I would, okay, here's the thing. I would never want to like preemptively say anything to her because she's a little bit. That's what I'm thinking. That, that's yeah. why it would scare me. It would have yeah. to be, there's no chance she could have known that I had seen that. Yeah. Oh man. Well, I don't know. I'd be scared both ways. Yeah. 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 Blah. No way. Man, if we come home and she's like, somebody wrote dogs on the bathroom oh my mirror God. while I was taking a shower. Uh, that's it. That's it. We're moving. <laughs> immediately. We are immediately moving. I don't want to stay. Oh, boy. Yeah, no. Nope. 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 <laughs> do you want to do some uh, Annabelle shout outs? I do. Go for it. Uh, I would like to thank the following Annabelles for supporting our show. Uh, Jess Easton. Pat Will. HD Hentai Gamer. Nice. Awesome. Uh, Christina Peacock. Peacock is a fun name. It is. Nick Smith. I mean, it's probably not fun for her. She's probably heard a lot of like. <laughs> oh, yeah. I guess maybe it's better that it's a, uh, a female. Eh. Uh, well, no one will be telling her that she has a pea-sized cock. No, but they'll be talking about things she's I doing know, with them. I know, I uh, know. Jacqueline Mannion, Star Garion, or Star Garion, uh, and Jackie Holden. I like that you just said Star Garion I know, I know. Star Garion. I tried to emphasize it differently. I'm like, oh, it sounds pretty much the same. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it's right. I'd like to thank the following Annabelles for continuing to support us on Patreon. Nicole Devlin, Hans Christian Madsen, PNW Paranormal. Oh, Pacific Northwest Paranormal. Haha, <laughs> got it. Addie Sanders, Queen of the Dreaded Locks. I like that. <laughs> Alex Riley, Travis Feltner, and Jams Tinsley. That's a Jams! <laughs> Are you going to do it? I was going to do the, the James Brown. This is a man's world. I was waiting for it. Jam. Because I did it in my brain. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's a weird time suck weird, reference. Weird James Brown quote. Okay. And then I'd like to do the following spooky shout outs to Maggie, my clumsy wife from Oscar. I love you. To Kirsten from Pete. You are my world. I can't imagine this journey with anyone else. Love you to the moon and back. You and Livy make my world complete. To Haley from Haley. Happy 26th birthday. To Milo, a.k.a. Zeke, from your dad, Diesel, happy belated birthday. To Phil, from Molly, I am eternally grateful to have you in my life. And to Macy, from Macy, happy birthday to me, but also happy anniversary to my partner, Danny, from me. Oh, happy <laughs> birthday to me. Also, happy anniversary to my partner, Danny. Me and the kids love you. I don't know why that was so hard. Well, you did it. Good job. I did it. I did it. You, you powered through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith, editing, publishing, scoring today's show. Thanks to Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails and to book editor Drew Atana. Thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week and Molly Box for finding the second. We are on YouTube if you'd like to watch a show. We're on Facebook and Instagram where we post pics that accompany episodes and more at Scared to Death Podcast. We also have a private Facebook group, Creeps and Peepers, full of fellow horror lovers. Uh, big thanks to the all-seen eyes, the Creeps and Peepers moderators who continue to be fantastic. Enjoy your nightmares, Creeps and Peepers. Hope you were scared to death. Bye. Jam! If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. All right, motherfucker, let's duel.